Shabbat Shalom, beloved. Um, it is so wonderful to be here again today and to be here with you all and to share what Hashem has placed on my heart for us um, to be blessed with as well. Um, before I begin, I just let me just pray. Um, Avenue, Shabbat Shabbat, our Father who is in heaven, we want to bless you today. You have afforded us the opportunity, um, a life once more, and you have afforded us the opportunity to assemble and to join together. Lord God, even on this platform, um, Lord, I humble myself before you, that you might be exalted. I pray, afternoon that every listener and everyone who will hear eventually will be blessed and encouraged, forewarned in some way about the Yeshua. Let your servant decrease in order that you might increase. I pray even so for every person who is even um, logged on even now, the community of SRMF, Abba, and even those by extension who have joined us today. I pray even so that your blessing will be upon this house, upon Rav and upon Reb as well, Abba, that, oh God, that you will cause, as it were, the anointing that flows from the head that flows down from Aharon HaKohen, Lord God, down his beard to the end of his robe, Abba, that you will cause the anointing, Lord, your anointing, um, that, that flows, oh God, to come upon us all today, B'Shem Yeshua, cause today to be a day like none other. Let there be um, revelation. Let there be breakthrough, B'Shem Yeshua, in our lives. And, and, and we bless you. In your great and mighty name we pray. Amen. We amen. So Shabbat Shalom again, brethren. Um, I would like to share with us today what I believe that the Lord has placed on my heart. And if I had to give a title for this drash, I would call it Reliance Upon Hashem in Every Generation. Reliance Upon Hashem in Every Generation. Um, in this week's parasha, the parasha Noah, we learned and we studied about a man and named Noah and ultimately how the world um, came, came to be saved and delivered um, in his merit. There are certain central themes which were introduced and which contribute to the framework of the entire Bible. Themes and concepts such as grace and pen in Hebrew, which also means favor of um, zedakah and, and righteousness, the, the idea of a sadik or a righteous person. Ideas and themes of redemption and judgment and long-suffering and mercy and, and, and of covenant and, and, and atonement. And we also... Um, we introduce to something that is quite relevant now, the, the idea or the concept of this Hamas that we learned about, this wickedness um, for the sake of wickedness, this violence for the sake of violence. No, no um, reason or no underlying factor needed just for the sake of it. And we have also learned and, and, and been introduced to the concept of Teshuvah as well. So... Moving forward, I have a question. I always like to try to pose questions to us. And the question I have to ask us is, remember, are you righteous in your generation? Are you righteous in the eyes of Elohim? Are you righteous in your generation? So turn with me. We're going to be moving to and fro. Turn with me in the book of Gracious Genesis chapter 6. We want to read from verses 9 to 13, Genesis chapter 6, verses 9 to 13. Here we go. 
it says, here is the history of Noah. In his generation, Noah was a righteous man and wholehearted. Noah walked with Elohim. Noah fathered three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the earth was corrupted before Elohim. The earth was filled with violence. And Elohim saw the earth, and yes, it was corrupt. For all living things had been corrupted in the ways on the earth. And Elohim said to Noah, the end of all living things is come before me. For because of them, the earth is filled with Hamas or violence. I will destroy them along with the earth. Let's scroll down to verses 17 now. We just want to read from verses 17 to 20. And it says, he says, then I myself will bring flood water over the earth and destroy from under the heaven every living thing that breathes. Everything on earth will be destroyed. But I will establish my covenant, there that word goes again, with you. And you will come into the ark, you and your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. Every, from every living thing, from each kind of living being, you are to bring two into the ark to keep them alive with you. They are to be male and female, of every kind of bird and every, each kind of livestock, and each kind of animal creeping on the ground, two are to come to you so that they will be kept alive. I mean, so the account of the flood. So here we see in his generation, Noah um, was seen, or Hashem rather saw Elohim as um, Hashem, sorry, saw Noah as being righteous in his generation, as a man who stood apart or stood out from the rest. And the account of the flood brings certain realizations to the forefront. All right. So the first one is that redemption could be brought about and grace could be extended and ultimately leveraged in an effort to save mankind from certain judgment. All right. According to our sages, Noah was ordered to engage in the building of this this ark, or in Hebrew it's called the Teva, right? Um, so that others might see, they might inquire, and in so doing, they might repent. They would see Noah building this thing for 120 years or so. And the purpose of it, as we have learned, is that Hashem was um, being long-suffering. He was being merciful unto the people. He could have, if he wanted to, created an ark instantaneously and put Noah and his family and all the, the animals into this ark and brought the floodwaters. But he allowed it to be this way and allowed Noah to, to carry on with this building for 120 years so that persons might inquire and persons might ask questions so that repentance might come about. However, that was not the case. Sadly enough, that was not the case. Can you imagine? No one, even though they asked, even though they might look up on him, the Torah said that they scoffed at him, they laughed at him. You understand? Let's turn to Exodus. We want to turn to the book of Exodus, chapter 32. Exodus, chapter 32. Exodus, chapter 32. Verses 7 to 14. Exodus 32. Right, verses 7 to 14. As I mentioned before, one a successful part or one, one, one beneficial part of what took place here was that we recognize that redemption could be brought about through or the, the merit or the virtue of a person, a person who Hashem chooses. All right. Uh, another aspect of this, when we look at Exodus 32, 7 to 14, it says, it says, and Adonai said to Moshe, go down, hurry. Your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have become corrupt. We're talking about the account here when um, the children of Israel had begun to worship the golden calf. So quickly, so quickly, they have turned aside from the way in which I ordered them to follow. They have cast a metal statue of a calf, worshipped it, and sacrificed and said, Israel, here is your God who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim. 
Adonai continue to speak to Moshe. I have been watching these people and I can see how stiff necked they are. Now, here's what Hashem says, leave me alone so that my anger may blaze against them and I can put an end to them. And I will make a great nation of you instead. Remember that line. I will make a great nation of you instead. And Moshe pleaded with Elohim and said, he said, Adonai, why must your anger blaze against your own people whom you have brought out of the land of Mitzrayim with, a great, with great power and a strong hand? Why let the Egyptians say it is with evil intentions that you have let them out to slaughter them in the hills? And wipe them off the face of the earth. In that expression, wipe them off of the face of the earth. Turn from your fierce anger. Relent. Don't bring such disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Yitzhak, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by yourself. You promised them, I will make your descendants as many as the stars in the sky. And I will give them all this land, which I have spoken about to your descendants, and they will possess it forever. And Adonai changed his mind about this disaster he had planned for his people. Another aspect of what took place in the account of the flood was that man's inherent nature recognized that is connected to the earth. He is an Ish Adama. He's a man of the soil or a man of the earth. He's made up of this, this clay substance. He's made up of this stuff. And therefore, as a result of it, and as a result of um, what was passed on through our father Adam, right? He is therefore sinful. The destruction of the human race and restarting through a particular lineage could not bring about the final redemption, restoration, and restoration to the state of Gan Eden. So here we see Moshe Rabbeinu, the, the author of the Torah, while he was writing the Torah, he remembered this. So Hashem would have, this is alluded to in the Torah. So when Hashem spoke to him and spoke to him about concerning Moshe, here's what, I am going to restart. I'm going to wipe out the Jewish people. And I'm going to start it all over with you. Here's Moshe rejecting the offer and saying, far be it from you, Hashem. Far be it from you. While writing the Torah, Moshe recalled that the redemption was not just for, the, for a few, but for all. And although he was the loftiest of souls, he was also the most humble man on the face of the earth. So Moshe understood that he was, he too was made up of this stuff of the earth, right? And the propensity for sin laid within him, within him, sorry, as well, having an entire, having an entire nation from his lineage, made from his lineage, or come forth from him, it, the result would not have been different. So he's looking here, and I want us to consider what took place, what took place after the, the generation was wiped off the face of the earth. There was only Noah, and there was his family alone. And what took place a little while after, some years down the road? Um, because, there's the question I posed us, because Noah was a righteous man, because Noah was different, because Noah found favor in Hashem's sight, did that guarantee, because um, through his lineage or through his, his, his descendants, did that guarantee that sin was completely done away with? No, there was no guarantee of that. So Moshe is holding through and he's holding fast to, to this concept and he's remembering, listen, even when Noah um, and, and even when the generation of Noah uh, had come forth, there, there was sin still in the world. And he's recalling and calling God to remember, listen, remember your promises. Remember your covenant with the patriarchs. Don't, don't, don't change your mind. Relent in, in this because you have promised that you you have promised that you will bring about the redemption through Abraham's seed. You have promised that you will bring about the redemption through Yeshua the Messiah. So let's understand and consider this a little kesha between Moshe and Noah. So both of them were both of them were of sorts, these 
people of this Teva or this Ark. Moshe was placed in this Teva, right? And this Ark as a baby, right? And in order to preserve life. And, and here we have Noah as well, right? Um, placed in him and his family in order to preserve life. And both were sealed as it were and insulated on the inside and on the out to ensure that the sanctity of that which was within um, was maintained, preventing the judgment, which represented by the waters outside, preventing these things from coming in. And we know and we have learned that the, the waters um, represent the judgment, but we learned that what is inside the ark represents the olam haba. It's a, a microcosm of the olam haba. We see in the ark there is this um, this miracle taking place, this miracle of the animals being subject to the will of, of, of mankind. And in the ark, there's no, all the, 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 the inclinations of the animals to, 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 to tear apart and to, to devour one another. All of that is subdued in the ark while they are there with, um, with, with Moshe not Moses, with, uh, with Noah and with his family as well. So Moses understood in order to truly enter into the Olam Haba, man's predisposition to sin needed to be addressed. Yeah? Changing, just simply changing or changing the candidate would not have brought about this, this redemption. Um, it's, it's the same as when Solomon, he, he expressed this in the, in the book of Ecclesiastes, when he spoke about working, uh, uh, it, it being vanity and working all his life under the sun. And after he had died or after a person he had died and accrued or amassed a great amount of wealth, um, that after that person died, they had no idea who would come after them and who would inherit that wealth or what that person would do. Maybe that person would be uh, a foolish person and squander it in, in, in a short period of time. And so it is that when, you know, a righteous person arises and, 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 and does um, what he has to for his generation, um, there must be or there needs be someone that Elohim will raise up to, to carry on the righteousness of that righteous person, to fulfill the purpose, the plan, um, to fulfill the covenant um, which, which, which God has established between him and man in order to see this thing fulfilled. And if this was not the case, if this were not the case, then it would result in a repetition of all the, all the folly and all the sin that was taking place before. So my question, could we be honest? Could we be humble could we be candid enough with ourselves to recognize to recognize that in ourselves in ourselves we have no strength in ourselves in and of ourselves we do not have what it takes there was an interesting expression an interesting phase phrase that was used to describe um noah and in studying i found it out that the righteous he was considered to be righteous and that expression was called Ish, he was an Ish Tam, an Ish Tam, and considered to be righteous. And this word has um, different meanings. And apart from being considered righteous, the word actually means to be a fool or to be uh, a clown. And while studying, I thought to myself, but that is strange. How was the, what is the Kesha? What is the connection between being righteous and being someone who considered to be like a fool or foolish or a clown and it, it 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 it's pretty cool when you think about it as i learned that that person or that person who is foolish has no um takes no um stock or no account for themselves in other words they have no reliance upon themselves they recognize or they are honest with themselves. They see um, the state of their own affairs, see their personal standing and recognize, listen, I need help. I need Hashem. So when we refer to Noah in his generation being righteous, being an Ishtam, 
what Noah recognized was that and he needed Hashem in everything. He needed him. He was completely dependent. He was completely reliant upon Hashem to be able to fulfill every task or to fulfill the task that he had been in that had been entrusted to him. I want us to look very quickly to Romans, the book of Romans chapter 7. Are we relying on him? And considering this, now we're looking at ourselves, we're looking at righteousness through this lens. Are we dependent upon Elohim? Are we relying upon Elohim for everything? Are we saying to Elohim, listen, the task which you have entrusted to me, I cannot do it on my own. I must depend on you. I must rely on you to bring me from point A to point B in order to sanctify your name. I cannot do it in myself. Well, listening to Rav Shaul in Romans chapter 7, verse 15 to 25, very quickly, and he says, I don't understand my own behavior. I, I don't do what I want to do. Instead, I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I am doing what I don't want to do, I am agreeing that the Torah is good. But, before, but now it is no longer the real me doing it, but the sin housed inside of me. For I know that there is nothing good housed inside of me that is inside my own nature. I can want what is good, but I can't do it. For I don't do the good I want. Instead, the evil I don't want is what I do. But if I am going if I am doing, sorry, what the real me doesn't want to do, it's no longer the real me doing it, but the sin housed in me. So I find myself, so I find it to be the rule, a kind of perverse Torah, that although I want to do what is good, evil is right there with me. For in, the, for in my inner self, I completely agree with Elohim's Torah. But in my various parts, I see a different Torah, one that battles within my mind and makes me a prisoner for sin's Torah, which is operating in my various parts. Hear what he's saying. What a miserable creature I am. He says, who will now rescue me from this body bound for death? Thanks be to Elohim. He will through Yeshua, the Messiah, our master. So here we see Rav Shaul. He is an expressing that he is an, an Ishtam. He needs Sasha. He needs Yeshua to help him. He cannot accomplish the task, what he's been entrusted to do on his own. He needs that, that, that deliverance. He needs that empowerment from, that comes only through Yeshua the Messiah. Each generation has a unique opportunity to merit redemption through obedience and through a desire to glorify Elohim. There's a choice in each generation or to suffer destruction, has for shalom, heaven forbid, by disobedience or by seeking to glorify self, to glorify self. All right? Let's look at Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 to 9. But we want to consider what took place in among in the Tower of Babel, Genesis 11, verses 1 to 9. It said the whole earth used the same language, the same words. It came about that they traveled from the east. They found a plain in the land of Shinar and lived there. They said to one another, come, let's make bricks and bake them in fire. So they, they had bricks, building stone and clay for mortar. And they said, come. Let's build ourselves a city with a tower that has its top reaching into heaven so that we can make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over all the earth. And then I came down to the city. So we see here, just pause from where. So we see here that their plan, that the plan that they had for themselves was in opposition to Hashem's plan. Firstly, it was all about them. We can make a name for ourselves. We want to build a tower reaching up to heaven that we would not be scattered. Hashem gave the directive to Noah and he said, 
multiply, be fruitful, multiply, and inhabit the earth. Go out into the earth, populate the earth. And we see here the men or the people of Babel, or Babel, sorry, they said to themselves, we are going to stay right here. We're going to build a tower that leads up to heaven and that we aren't going to disperse. We aren't going to go and populate the earth. We're going to contend with heaven. It's all about us. We're making a name for ourselves. And Adonai from verse 5, Adonai came down to see the city and the tower of the people building. And Adonai said, look, the people are united. They have a single language. See what they are starting to do. At this rate, nothing will be, nothing they set out to accomplish will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse their language so they won't understand each other's speech. So from there, Adonai scattered them all over the earth. They stopped building the city. For this reason, it is called Bavel, meaning confusion, because Adonai confused the language of the whole earth. And from there, Adonai, what did he do? He scattered them all over the earth. In other words, he fulfilled the plan that he wanted, go populate the earth. So what do we see here? We see, firstly, we mentioned before that they set their minds and they set their will in opposition to the will of Hashem. They were determined to make war against Elohim. They, last week we read and we, we spoke about the spirit of Amalek and how one of the expressions that they said that um, his hand, his, Amalek says his hand was against the throne of Yah, right? We see the influence. Here again, we see the influence of the Hasatan, may his name be blotted out, rearing its head once more, showing, showing up once more um, after the garden and showing up after the flood. This is after the flood. Again, I'm looking to Isaiah chapter 14, just to give us some context. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 3 to 4. To start off with, and then it says, Then Adonai, then when Adonai gives you rest from your suffering and from your trouble, and from the hard service imposed on you, you will take up this taunt against the king of where? Of Babel. Of Babel. Scroll down to verse 12 now. And here we see, tell me if this doesn't sound familiar. How did you come, come to fall from the heavens? Morning star of the dawn. How did you come to be cut down to the ground, conqueror of nations? You thought to yourself, I will scale the heavens. I will raise my throne above Elohim stars. I will sit on the mount of assembly far away in the north. I will rise past the tops of the clouds and I will make myself like the most high. And it goes on to say, instead you were brought down to Sheol to the uttermost depths of the pit. Those who see you will stare at you, reflecting on what has become of you. Is this the man who shook the earth? The man who made the kingdoms tremble? Who made the world a desert? Who destroyed its cities? Who would not set it's prisoners free. So we can tell and we can see that this pronunciation or this judgment through the prophet Isaiah is made to the quote unquote king of Babel, this taunt against the king of Babel. And we see it here that we see that the, the people of Babel, they built up this tower because they wanted to contend with Elohim. They said to themselves, listen, in their generation, my way, my plan, my ambition takes priority. Are we doing the same thing? Are we assessing our own minds and our own hearts? Are we asking ourselves or are we say, you know, the, the hard questions, is it my way or the highway? Are we saying, you know, God, um, nobody outrightly opens their mouth, right? And verbalizes, you know, God, you take a back seat. But these things are manifest in our mind and then they become even so more so manifest by our actions, by, by what we do. I, I read a, a midrash and it said that the people of, of Babel were so corrupt that then they were building the tower, they would climb up to the height and if a brick would fall off, they would be so distraught. They would say to themselves, oh my goodness, we lost a brick. Now somebody has to go all the way back down to get the brick. If a, 
person who was working along the tower fell off. They considered it as if it was nothing. You know, that person died, let's continue the work. We don't even have to bury them. This is priority. So for us, we see that where um, our ambition or, 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 the, or, the, or the, the drive or our ambition to accomplish a task becomes more important than the persons involved. Even within the Messianic community, there we know we have gone off the rails. There we know we have to mash the brakes. There we know we have to check ourselves. When the task becomes more important than the people. So such is the case that happens in human history. They chose, the people of Babel chose to ignore the spiritual advantages and turn their opportunities, turn um, opportunities for self-aggrandizement and power they sought after their own well-being. We have only two choices. We can glorify, exalt Elohim or glorify and exalt ourselves. It seems ludicrous that a person who had evidence of the flood found grounds to rationalize a way of passing Elohim's control of events. Picture this, consider this. Righteous Noah, righteous Shem, and righteous Abram, they were alive at, at the time of the events, right? That, uh, that was taking place in Babel. They had eyewitnesses, persons who were alive at the point in time to, to give clarity or to instruct or to give direction as to listen, y'all, we are going the wrong way. We are choosing the wrong path. Let's turn away from this. But they, here's what they said, they rationalized away by passing control of God's events, by passing it. But such is a man's capacity for self-deception, that he can negate reality and build substance even around a vacuum. And I read this, I said, my God, we can so be deceived. We can so deceive ourselves. We see the deception that the enemy brings, that the Hasatan brings, because we're studying and we're looking at the people of Babel and we understand and we recognize that it is the same spirit at work. And they're so deceived. They're so into self, so into their purposes that they completely ignore. They completely ignore what Hashem says to them to do. And he now has to come down and intervene. And it's actually an act of mercy that they too weren't destroyed. Instead of their destruction, he changes their languages and scatters them all over the world. Nimrod was the primary source of this rebellion. He planned to build a tower to heaven and from it wage war against Elohim. The people of Babel received a measure for measure punishment. Um, they attempted to disrupt the unity between the heavens and between the earth. So their unity was disrupted in turn. I say this, a people, a nation, um, a people group, even humanity who does not learn from their past experiences is doomed to repeat it. If we don't learn from what happened yesterday, if we don't turn away, if we don't do Teshuva, guess what? We're bound to repeat the same mistakes. We're bound to make them again. And immediately I think about the fact that, you know, each generation has certain opportunities. Each generation has an opportunity to do Teshuva by the grace that Elohim has extended. And if we, we have, we now have the the benefit of the Torah. We have the benefit of the Bible. So we could look back and we could see and we could learn from where the past generations have gone wrong. And this is our opportunity to do so. Another point is here, Yeshua Messiah, he is the completely righteous Sati in whom there is no sin and he has redeemed mankind. He has once and for, for all time atoned for sinful man. He has obtained 
immeasurable favor with Elohim. And in turn, that has been extended to all humanity in order to save us from the coming destruction. From the coming destruction. I want us just to read as I close the account of Luke chapter 14 first. Luke chapter 14. Verse 15 to 24. Luke chapter 14, verse 15 to 24. And it says, on hearing this, one of the people at the table with Yeshua said to him, how blessed are those who eat bread, eat the bread in the kingdom of Elohim. But he replied, once a man gave a banquet and invited many people. When the time came for the banquet, he sent his slave to tell those who had been invited, come. Everything is ready. But they responded with a chorus of excuses. The first said to him, I've just bought a field and I have to go out and see it. Please accept my apologies. And another said to him, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to test them out. Please accept my apologies. Still another said, I've just gotten married so I can't come. The slave came and gave reports to his master. It went on to say that the owner of the house, in a rage, totally saved, quick, go out into the streets and the alleys of the city. Bring the poor and the disfigured, the blind and the crippled. The slave said, sir, what you ordered has been done and there is still more room. The master said to the slave, now go out into the country roads and the boundary walls and insistently persuade people to come in. So my house will be filled. I tell you that not one of those who were invited will taste of my banquet. I want us to listen and check out what went on here. That here we see that the master um, is giving a parable of this banquet and he's extending invitations. I want us to notice very, very, very carefully that he gave also this 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 indication in luke chapter 17 very quickly verses 26 to 27 here's what he said luke 17 26 to 7 20, 26 to 29 he said also at the time of the son of man it will just it will be just as the time of noah people ate and drank and men and women married right up until the day noah entered into the ark when the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it is, as it was in the time of Lot, when people ate and drank, bought and sold, planted and built. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. Can we see the striking similarity here? Can we see that notice at the time of judgment, the invited guests, were occupied doing the very same things that or were concerned with the same cares that those um, at the time of Noah, those at the time of Lot, can we see that they were doing the same thing? And I liken the I liken the the invited guests as to the to the to the to the disciples, the various disciples, those who fear Hashem. And here we have Messiah extending this invitation. And they're saying, I'm too busy. I can't come because of this. I can't come because of that. And here's the thing. When we look at it, we're seeing that those same ones were the ones who were taken away in Noah's time. They were the same ones who were too busy, who were too concerned. They were taken away in judgment. They were taken away in judgment. Look, the disciples, he's making, he's making, Hashem is making an invitation, extending an invitation to his banquet and be concerned with so many different things about the cares of this world. So here are some, just a few, just a few points. But guess what? Who, who responded? Who responded? The poor, the disenfranchised. Who responded? The Ish Tamim, those who were, those who consider them, who are considered to be um, fools, those who were dependent upon Hashem. In other words, the poor in spirit, those who need Hashem, they took up the call. 
they took up um, the invitation. They took time to come to the master's banquet. I pray today that we are the ones in this generation who recognize and realize that we are in our own selves, we are deficient and we too must take up the call, that we must take up the invitation and not be, um, not be confused and not be caught up and not be entangled and ensnared by the things of this world. So some closing remarks. First, judgment is inevitable. Hashem's mercy does have an expiry date. He will not allow sin to continue or to go on perpetually unchecked. This is not, this is in, in keeping, sorry, with his holiness. His promise, he promised, sorry, never to destroy the earth again by water, but he will destroy, bring about destruction by fire. Two, number two, choose to stand out. Choose to be like Noah. Choose to be an Ishtam. Choose to be dependent upon Yeshua, upon his favor, reliant upon him, his grace. Point three, favor requires a response. There is no middle ground to be had. If I remember the, the, the words of the prophet Eliyahu, if Elohim is Elohim, then serve him, but make up your mind. Favor has been extended to us, to this generation. And this, this time now that we're living in could be our finest hour if we choose to accept it, if we choose to arise to the hour and arise to the call that's been placed before us. Let us not miss the day of our visitation as in the, 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 the age or the, the generation of our master. He's extended, um, he's extended as it were, his, his scepter of righteousness. He's extended as it were grace to us in this generation. Far be it from us to, to be so swept up and so concerned with the, the waters, the flood waters of this life. So swept up in the deluge and the tsunami of cares and concerns and worries that we turn aside from Hashem. All he's waiting on is the right response before it's too late. The choice is ours. The choice is ours. And finally, don't rationalize your way into judgment. Understand that obedience to Hashem and his desires, it means that we must live according to what he says. Let's stop, let's stop putting it off till tomorrow, putting it off till next week. We aren't perfect. Neither was Noah, but here's what. Our master has met all, he's met all the requirements for perfection. So in him, his, his grace, his grace is sufficient for us in every situation. His grace is sufficient for us in every trial, in every, um, every tribulation, everything that we do face. And finally, we must recognize that the, the, the spirit or the, the principality of Hasatan that is, work at, is at work in our generation and vehemently denounce it, not stand aside, not stay quiet, not remain silent in the midst of it all. And in light of even what is taking place in Israel, in light of what is taking place in the nations, we, have, we do not have the luxury of staying quiet. We don't have the luxury of, of being or of trying to toe the line as it were. Amen. So I want to bless us this afternoon and I want to, to remind us today, to tell us today that we must be reliant upon Hashem in our generation. May we merit um, to be the generation that will usher in the return of our Messiah, may it be soon, swiftly, and in our days. Hashem Yeshua. Amen. Amen.